Good, mor <clears throat> Good morning, friends. Good, morning. Good to see all of you on this uh, Lord's Day. Um, let me share just a couple of announcements with you. Uh, we've scheduled to have a blank Sunday um, two weeks from today. Um, this is promoted by Church World Service, and through our gifts, we are looking to blanket the world with love. So that special offering will be uh, one week from next Sunday. And looking ahead, we will have a Girl Scout Sunday on the first Sunday in March. The Girl Scouts will have their cookies and other goodies for us to purchase. And so um, this is a way that we can help them um, continue their programming. And now I invite us to turn our attention to the choir as they call us to worship today. Thank you, fellas. And now, as Christians, all of us have a story to tell all the nations. And I uh, now invite us to, uh, uh, to stand and let us sing together hymn number 427. We have a story to tell to the nations.
Please be seated and let us join our voices together in the invocation. You'll find the words printed in your bulletin in the bold print. Let us pray. Lord of life, our souls thirst for this day. We long for a breath of fresh air. Our minds have grown stale and our hearts have weakened. Your son has promised us an abundant life. But we, O Lord, have forgotten that a promise becomes a reality only when we reach out to receive it. May this service of worship be our time for reaching out as we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, our scripture reading for this day is found in the Gospel of Mark. I'll be reading from the first chapter, beginning at the 29th verse. Before I do so, however, let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for not only your presence in our world and in our worship, but we give you thanks that your presence is felt in your word, the Bible. Be with all of us who are gathered here this day and open our hearts and our minds to all that Jesus has to teach us. Be with us and enlighten us through the reading of our scriptures. In his name we pray it. Amen. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Here ends our reading from our scripture text this day. Again, may God's spirit be with us as we seek to apply the truths of this passage to our own spiritual lives. Amen.
Thank you, fellas. In today's scripture text, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law of a fever, cures many others who are sick with various diseases, and casts out demons from many who were possessed. Given this important ministry of Jesus, I, I want to make a distinction between a cure and a healing. Let me give you a, a biblical illustration of what I mean. As Jesus journeys toward Jerusalem and goes through Jericho, he hears a blind man named Bartimaeus call out to him. Jesus stops. He then asks the blind man, what do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus immediately asks to be cured so that he can see again. And Jesus grants his request. But I suspect something else has happened beyond the cure Jesus, that Jesus provides for the blind man. I suspect something inside of him is healed, something in his soul. For the Bible tells us that Bartimaeus follows Jesus. On the one hand, with Bartimaeus, we see a physical cure. The blind man's sight is miraculously restored. On the other hand, we also see something inside the man change as he moves from being a beggar to being a follower of our Lord. Let me give you another biblical illustration that can help us understand the distinction between a cure and a healing. Mary Magdalene, the Bible tells us, was possessed by seven demons and Jesus casts all of them out. Now, whole and sane, the focus of Mary's life then changes, and she becomes a follower of Jesus. As a disciple, she helps out by financially supporting his ministry. On the one hand, we can say that Jesus cures her mind of evil possession, while on the other hand, he heals her soul in that now she has something to live for, proclaiming the presence of God's kingdom. 
Let me give you one more biblical illustration. At a well outside the city of Sychar in Samaria, Jesus meets a woman who has come to fill her water jug. She does not have any physical ailment, nor is she possessed by demons. However, in the conversation between Jesus and the woman, something deep in the woman's soul is healed. She was thirsting for acceptance, perhaps for an affirming marital relationship. And as Jesus and the woman talk, it becomes clearer and clearer to her that God loves her and affirms her for who she is. The love of God slakes her thirst. While she had no physical infirmities of which she needed to be cured, Jesus heals her heart, her soul. And now she knows without a doubt that she matters to God. Let me use another example, a more modern illustration. It comes from a 1992 movie entitled Scent of a Woman. The two main characters are Frank Slade and Charlie Sims. Frank Slade is a middle-aged former colonel who had gained a reputation for his daring, though sometimes erratic, behavior. During a stunt involving juggling some live grenades, he became a victim of his own bravado and lost his eyesight. Not only did he lose his sight, but he also lost his career in the army and also his sense of self and his reason for being. When we meet him at the beginning of the movie, he has become a cantankerous semi-invalid living in a garage apartment behind his daughter's home just outside of New York City. Frank is the first of the movie's main characters. The second is Charlie Sims. Charlie is a student at the local prep school who has been hired by Frank's daughter to stay with her father, Frank, as his caretaker over the course of the whole weekend so that Frank's family can get away for the Thanksgiving holiday. Now, coming from a modest background, Charlie is hoping that he can earn enough money this weekend so that he can spend the Christmas holiday with his own family, which lives way out on the West Coast. What Frank's daughter and her family do not know is that following their departure, without their knowledge, Frank has, a, has arranged for a limousine to take him and Charlie into the city where he has made arrangements to dine at an expensive restaurant. He's looking forward to a fine meal and some high-priced wine and some female companionship. At one point during their fling in New York City, Frank reveals to Charlie that after this weekend is over, he is going to commit suicide. This understandably upsets Charlie. However, even with that as a backdrop, let me share three of the highlights of uh, the weekend. One includes Frank's dancing a tango with a young woman at the restaurant. Another proves that he still has the strength and the guts to thrash an annoying relative who cannot keep from taunting him. And third, even though he is blind, he rents a sports car in Charlie's name. And with Charlie's help, he drives it himself at a high speed. In the midst of these and other highlights, Char uh, Charlie manages to convince Frank that he should not commit suicide and that he cannot do so without bringing further distress to a family that, he already, that Frank already regrets burdening with his own problems. So when they return from the city on that Monday, Charlie is summoned to a disciplinary healing, hearing uh, by the headmaster of the prep school he attends. Apparently he has seen 
three of his classmates who belong to quite wealthy families. He has seen them in the midst of their wrongdoing and has failed to report the incident to the headmaster. Now Frank insists on accompanying young Charlie primarily because Frank is appreciative of Charlie's help in reputing in repudiating his interest in suicide and wants to repay him for being so supportive during this entire weekend. Now at the hearing, the headmaster threatens Charlie with expulsion, for without his testimony, the three wealthy boys will all get off scot-free. At that point, Frank speaks up on behalf of Charlie how do I say this? Uh, using colorful language, Frank highlights the hypocrisies of the situation. With Frank's support, Charlie is ultimately exonerated, while his rich classmates are left humiliated. In this process, Frank attracts the attention of a woman who teaches at the school. And when he returns to his daughter's home, he behaves with uncharacteristic kindness toward the teacher's young children. Although Frank Slade is an ext extravagantly vulgar character, he realizes that being over the top is a part of who he is. And yet another insight shows how he has gotten over himself, that he is not all that this is not all or even the essence of who he is. You and I might say that Frank has been battling his own demons for a long time. Confronting his demons has not made Frank any the less blind physically, but it has permitted him a different kind of recovery. He now has a new understanding about himself. He has not been cured but he has been healed. This is the kind of healing that Jesus does from time to time again throughout the Gospels. I've already mentioned Bartimaeus and Mary Magdalene and the woman at the well. But the truth is, the list goes on and on. Let's see. There's Zacchaeus and Nicodemus and the woman caught in adultery and the man who lived among the tombs, who was possessed by a, de a legion of demons. And then there were the over 5,000 men, women, and children who followed Jesus into the wilderness just to hear him speak about God and life and the presence of God's kingdom. People whose spirits needed to hear an encouraging word, whose hearts needed to know that they mattered to God who needed to be healed on the inside more than they needed to be cured from this or that, whose spirits needed to be fed. These are the people who came out that day. And miraculously, Jesus did feed their minds and hearts through his teaching. But because at the end of the day, they were also physical beings and they needed to be fed physically, which Jesus did with only five loaves and two fish. Now, friends, I could go on and on. Jesus met people wherever they were. Some of them wanted a cure, but all of them needed to be healed in here and up here. Now, in the movie, which I referenced this morning, Frank Slade's blindness was not cured, but Frank was blessed with an insight about himself and his life, and he had a, re uh, a renewed sense that he counted. After his weekend with Charlie, he, in fact, no longer considered suicide. In addition, he did what his better self called on him to do by standing up for his new young friend, Charlie. And in the end, 
He caught the perfume scent of a new possibility for his life when the female teacher at the school showed some interest in him. Now, unlike Frank in the movie, all of us who are here today can see with our eyes. But in fact, life has a way of blinding us to what we truly need, blinding us to our life's purpose. Yes, so many of us are blinded by, blinded by, well, life itself. We are blinded by the challenges, by the difficulties, by the conundrums with which life confronts us. And Jesus, my friends, helps us to reclaim, to renew our vision. And isn't this what all of us need? A renewed sense of purpose in life, a goal or goals beyond our personal ones. The sense that we count, that God loves us, that we matter to God. Now, friends, there is a song which captures this perspective. It's called, He's He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. Let's listen to the choir as they sing this song. And if you know the words, I invite you to join them. You can remain seated, and you'll find the words on the bulletin insert. But we don't have to stop here. Let's, uh, let's add uh, a verse. He's got blind Bartimaeus in his hand. Uh, let's have a little fun with it. Uh, now I want you to sing, he's got Don and Linda Beach in his hands. He's got Don and Linda Beach in his hands. He's got Don and Linda Beach in his hands. He's got Don and Linda Beach in his hands. He's got the whole world. And now John and Ruth Darby. He's got John and Ruth Darby in his hands. He's got John and Ruth Darby in his hands. He's got John and Ruth Darby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Dave and Judy, would you stand up, please? And let's sing Dave and Judy Dunn. In his hands, he's got Dave and Judy Dunn. 
In his hands he's got the whole world. In his hands he's got the whole world. In his hands he's got the whole world. In his hands. And now Mike and Lou and Mary Louise. Mike and Mary Louise. In his hands he's got Mike and Mary Louise. In his hands he's got a Mike and Mary Louise. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. And what about Marilyn and Denny Jackson? Want to raise your hands so everybody knows where you are? In his hands he's got Marilyn Danny Jackson. In his hands he's got Marilyn Danny Jackson. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. Judy and, De and Denny, would you please stand up? Let's add Judy and Denny to the list. Then in his hands is God Judy and Denny. In his hands is God Judy and Denny. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. Erica, would you please stand? Corey and Erica. He's got Corey and Erica. Erica. In his hands he's got Corey and Erica. In his hands he's got Corey and Erica. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. And Alan and Joyce. It's got Alan and Joyce. In his hands he's got Alan and Joyce. In his hands he's got Alan and Joyce. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. Jim, would you stand up for you and your wife Marilyn? Jim and Marilyn in his Pam, would you please stand up? Chuck and Pamela. Chuck and Pam, Pamela. In his hands he's got Chuck and Pamela. In his hands he's got Chuck and Pamela. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. Uh, and Bonnie, please stand up. Uh, this time we'll sing Bonnie and Her Family. He's got Bonnie, Bonnie and her family. In his hands he's got Bonnie and her family. In his hands he's got Bonnie and her family. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. Joni, want to stand up, please? And we'll sing uh, Joni and Her Family. He's got Joni and Her Family. In his hands, he's got Joni and Her Family. In his hands, he's got Joni and Her Family. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. And uh, Brian, let's sing to Brian Baker and his family. He's got a Brian Baker's family. In his hands, he's got Brian and his family. In his hands, he's got 
Brian and his family. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. Lois, please stand up. Now, you're here by yourself, but um, a lot of times your friend Bobby comes. So let's sing Lois and Bob, uh, Bobby. He's got Lois and Bobby in his hands. He's got Lois and Bobby in his hands. He's got Lois and Bobby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Now I save this uh, to next to last because I didn't know what to do. Um, Noreen, you and Susan want to stand up? Yeah. How, how do, wait a minute. How do I do this? It's Glenn and Noreen, Rita and Susan, right? Yeah. You want to try that? Yeah. All right, let's do that. He's got a Glenn and Noreen, Rita and Susan. He's got the whole world in his hands. Bob and Patricia. Let's do Bob and Patricia. He's got a Bob and Patricia in his hands. He's got Bob and Patricia in his hands. He's got Bob and Patricia in his hands. He's got you see, friends, it's not just our church. It's, it's all people all around the globe, even those who don't attend a church, the rich and the poor, those who live on the street, the loved and the lonely. He's got the whole world in his hands. And for that, we can be grateful. Amen is right. At this time, I would like to um, invite us to a time of prayer. Let us unite our hearts and our minds. Let us pray. O oh God, all authority derives from you. Through the power of your words, you called this world into existence. Help us to remember that you are Lord above all lords, all mayors and governors and presidents. Redirect our ultimate loyalties to you, first and last, that we may never confuse loyalty to a human institution with the loyalty we owe to you. By your grace, O oh God, we are citizens of this nation the United States of America. Forgive us when we fail to do our part to keep our democracy healthy. Guide us as we work for its well-being. Guard our lips from inflammatory rhetoric that produces much heat but little light. Cleanse us from bigotry and self-centeredness in the pursuit of our own narrow interest in the public arena. Your word teaches that the long-term security of all depends on the strength of each one. So strengthen our resolve that we may exercise our precious votes for what is right, not just for what is personally advantageous. Show us, O oh God, how to carry out your will in the public arena, that we may be respectfully and intelligently able to develop opportunities of liberty and justice for all. Our nation faces many issues, and we pray for your guidance in the light of especially defeating the coronavirus, enhancing our environment, offering care and justice to, to the citizens of all races, making the... Between, 
help us to heal the deep divisions between the members of our political parties and help us to listen for your voice above the voices of division among our leadership. Purify our hearts and minds that we may learn to renounce exploitation and prejudice in all its forms and so contribute to the well-being of the community in which we live. O oh God, we pray that you will guide our, futures, our church's future direction. Strengthen our ministry that we may be not only a light for this church and its members, but also our neighborhood and the wider community. Enrich our voices that our love for you may be heard through all we say. Bless our deeds of compassion that your love may be seen in all that we do for others. Today we lift up prayers for Marcus and Jane, Debbie, Ginny, Bill and Greta, Don and Irene, and Joyce. We pray for Joan and Dan Jr., for Lana and Dorothy, Pat and Olga. We pray that your spirit will be with Shelley, Bob and Carol, Marilyn, Bob and Diana, Rosemary, and Shirley. Let your healing presence draw near to Dave, Lee, TJ, and Trandon, Mary Jo, and Patty. Let your spirit draw near to Duff and Harmony, and Wanda who faces surgery on Tuesday, and Daryl, Patty and Daryl, Lois's friend, and Dr. B and Susie. And let uh, Joyce be aware of your presence as she heals and faces surgery herself. You know the needs of each and every one of these persons whom we have just named. And we pray, O oh God, that you, who knows what they each need, we pray them that we pray that you will grant them the desires of their hearts. We offer prayers for our newly elected president and the members of his administration, and for the leaders of all the nations. We pray that you will guide them in the ways of peace with justice. And now, O oh God, in the silence of these moments, hear our individual prayers as each one of us comes to you with our thoughts and prayers and petitions. Hear us now, O God, as we lift to you the words to the prayer which Jesus himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And let me offer a prayer um, in gratitude for all of you who continue to support the work of St. John's. Let us pray. O oh God, I lift up the, the members and friends of St. John's who continue to support our church with their time, efforts, and financial gifts. I pray that you will bless them richly. Amen. And now let us continue our service of worship by rising and singing hymn number 455, Here at Your Table, Lord.
Please be seated. Friends, here at uh, St. John's United Church of Christ, we practice what we call open communion. That means that anyone who is present is welcome at this table. You don't have to be a member of this church or of any particular church. All that we ask is that you be seeking after God in your heart. You do not need to be sinless, for we believe that God forgives all our sin. Nor do you need to be perfect, for God is in the process of perfecting each and every one of us. With these words of invitation, we come to this time of communion in our service of worship. Before I go any further, I'm wondering, Judy, would you come up and help me serve? You'll need to put on this glove. Let, uh, let's join our hearts in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for the faithfulness of your servants throughout the ages. We thank you for the faithfulness of Abraham and Sarah and their family. We thank you for the faithfulness of all the leaders of the nation, people like Moses and Joshua. We thank you for the faithfulness of, uh, of people like Huldah and Elijah, your prophets. And we thank you for the faithfulness of your servant Mary, for it is through Mary that you brought your son into this world. We thank you for the faithfulness of Jesus, that as he went about doing his work, proclaiming the presence of your kingdom in our midst, that he was able to heal people of their diseases and drive the demons out of their lives. He raised people from death. He cured those who were blind and unable to walk. We thank you for his faithfulness in all of these things. We thank you that his faithfulness brought people to listen to him so that he might speak about you and your kingdom. We thank you that his faithfulness took him to a cross, for it is on that cross that we see how much you love all of your children. And we thank you that following his death, that after three days you raised him, and that um, he now lives in our presence in this world. We also thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst. We thank you for the blessing of the Spirit's presence with us today, and in all the ministries that St. John's United Church of Christ wants to carry out in our community. Be with us so that we always might be your faithful disciples. In Christ's name we pray it. Amen. <coughs> now friends, it was on the night of betrayal and desertion that when Jesus was at table with the disciples, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he blessed and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, remember me. And likewise, after the supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the remission of sins. As often as you drink it, remember me. And so, ministering to you in his name, we offer you this bread and this cup. Come now, for all things are ready. Friends, may this communion of the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, be a blessing to you now and forever as your faith is renewed and refreshed. Amen. Friends, as you leave this place and go out into the world, May God cure all your ailments, 
and heal your inner wounds. And as you go forth from this time together, may Jesus renew your life's calling and your life's purpose. And as you walk out into your daily life in the week ahead, may the Holy Spirit remind you that God loves you and that you matter to the Lord God. And now let the people of God say, Amen.